Welcome to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information, visit us at compasslu.org. Amen. Thanks, Paul. There was a young man who grew up in North Carolina. He got into sports at a young age, mostly because of the influence of his older brother, but eventually settled on playing baseball and basketball. By the time he got to high school, his main dream was to make the varsity basketball team. His sophomore year, this young man tried out for varsity, and he was one of the last few that were cut by that coach. And uh, he was fortunately offered a spot on the junior varsity team, which was not his goal, not his dream, but that's what was offered to him nonetheless. And uh, this turned out to be a crossroads in the life of this young man. He had a decision to make. Uh, He was devastated that he was not (laughs) chosen for what he wanted. He wanted to be on that varsity team. Uh, He could choose to focus on a different sport. He was a great baseball player. There were other sports that he could play. Um, He could quit sports altogether and work on something else. He was a smart young man. He could have done any number of things. So what did this young man do? He did not give up on basketball. He took that spot on the JV team. He showed up almost every day early before school to practice in the gym at the school. Uh, He worked hard uh, playing against his older brother and other people at the hoop at his house and in the neighborhood. He received the coaching from the JV coach and he got better. And he ended up dominating playing junior varsity basketball, scoring 40 points uh, on regular occasions. The following year, his junior year, not only did he make the varsity team, uh, he scored 35 points in his first varsity game. He'd be highly recruited to play college basketball. He ended up playing basketball at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He'd end up in the NBA, and he played in the NBA for many years. He'd go on to arguably be the greatest basketball player that ever played the game. You might have heard his name. I'm talking about Michael Jordan. (laughs) Michael Jordan was cut from his varsity team sophomore year of high school. And the funny thing about Michael Jordan's story is I would love to tell you that this is an all-American, pull yourself from your, up by your bootstraps kind of story. Um, we love those kinds of stories, especially in this country. We love to be independent and do our own thing. And it's just all this hard work that he put in is what led him to have success and to be in the NBA and to do all those things. But there's a problem with that narrative. I left out a very important, some important details about Michael's life sophomore year versus Michael's life junior year. Sophomore year, Michael Jordan was 5'10 and considered skinny, which means that what I looked like in sophomore year and what Michael Jordan looked like in sophomore year were probably pretty similar. (laughs) Now, I've grown only outward since then. Uh, He has grown up. (laughs) Uh, So he grew six inches between his sophomore year and his junior year, and because of the time in the gym and the time in the weight room, he gained some weight between those years as well. And that gave him more prototypical basketball size. So what's the moral of this story? I believe the moral of the story is that positive change generally requires two kinds of things. Positive change requires that we do what we know to do. We put in the time in the gym. Uh, We go, we work hard, we do the things that we know we're supposed to do. Positive change does require that. We have to do our part. We have to stay committed. But positive change also generally requires some outside influence, some outside help. Uh, We need friends to support our life as we make positive changes. We need encouragement. Or we need a growth spurt, like Michael Jordan needed a growth spurt. He needed it physically. He needed to physically grow six inches to make himself a more competitive basketball player. But sometimes we need growth spurts too, whether that's uh, mentally uh, or spiritually. And when we think about spiritual change, we know that there's two parties involved. There's us, and then there's him. There's God. This morning I want to talk a little bit about change in the new year. It's a time when we think about the past year. We consider uh, the things that we've gone through, the experiences that we've had, and how uh, we want to improve and grow and build upon things in the new year. It's a time to think more deeply about life and how we want to see Uh, positive change as we go into the next year. It's a time of hope for what could be. And yet we know the stereotypes around most New Year's resolutions. How long do they last? Uh, Two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months maybe? So today I want to offer you a New Year's resolution that I believe you can accomplish 
and that I believe will meaningfully, positively change your life. And that is to be transformed and not conformed. And if you are a uh, big fan of Paul's epistles, you know that our text this morning is in Romans chapter 12. So if you want to turn there, uh, we'll be there in a moment. Unlike the fitness goals you might have had in, in prior New Year's, uh, which depended on your strength of will and maybe uh, the will of a workout partner. I know the longest I've lasted in a new workout routine, I've had people around me supporting me, helping me make those positive decisions. Um, unlike those resolutions, your spiritual workout partner is the Lord. <laughs> it's God. And he's going to do his part. We just have to do ours. So in Romans chapter 12, this is a, probably a verse that we're, uh, a couple of verses here that we're pretty familiar with, and I want to think about things uh, a little differently this morning. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is what we'll read. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, in the text there uh, is a word that generally can mean brothers and sisters. So, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, when I was looking through this, uh, coming up to this sermon, um, a lot of the commentaries I looked at talk about how this section in Romans is very much like the section in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, where the book of Ephesians is sort of split in half, where the first half is more doctrinally focused, and the second half is more practically focused. Well, this is the transition point for Paul in this epistle. It comes not halfway through. It comes like three quarters of the way through. But nonetheless, it is his transition from all the doctrinal stuff that he's been saying in the first 11 chapters to the practical ways he wants people to live out the gospel. And it starts here in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And as many point out, the fact that Paul, you know, Paul's working with the Spirit of God, obviously, to do this. Uh, the reason why Paul would do this kind of thing, he does it in Ephesians, he does it in Romans, it underlines an important point for us. And that is that anytime you present the gospel to someone, anytime when the gospel is taught and it's understood, the natural consequence of that is it is meant to be lived. The gospel is always meant to be lived. And so that's why in all these epistles we have both doctrine and practice. To use other words that we use in our Ephesians series, uh, when we encounter Jesus, when we encounter the power and the grace of God freshly, it should transform our whole lives. It should transform what we say, what we think, and what we do. Now, in Ephesians, we saw that the transition point between what he said in the first part of that epistle and what he said in the last part of that epistle centered around the theme of unity, walk worthy and uh, it's really focused on the unity. He gets into the six, uh, the ones of uh, there in, in Ephesians chapter four, verses like four through six. So you get all these ones, you get all these principles for all focus on walking in unity because that's the focus of the book of Ephesians. But in Romans, it's really cool here that the specific things that he points out here fits with what he's been talking about in Romans, which is that the gospel is the deliverance from the power of sin and death, that that makes available a new way of living, a new way to live and flourish and honor God in all that we do. And so that's how Paul makes that transition here in this one. That's the difference between what he does here and what he does in Ephesians. But just also as we saw in Ephesians, we can see Paul's pastoral heart here. He starts with the words, I appeal to you. He's appealing to them. So one mind picture that we can get from this is Michael Jordan's JV coach. He knows that Michael's disappointed not making the varsity, putting his arm around him and saying, look, we can do this. We can improve this here. You can get better. You can also think about another mind picture I thought of with this appealing is a, a mother or a father taking a young child and saying, hey, come here, talk to me. And instead of, you know, the prototypical yelling at them or whatever, just pulling them aside and saying, hey, we don't do that. You know, we're not, we don't hit our brother or our sister, right? Um, that's the kind of language that Paul's using there. He's appealing to them. He's beseeching them. And behind his words are the mercies, plural, of God. And this reminds us that whenever we act in grace, whenever we act in love, all of our actions formulated by grace and love in Christ are the mercies of God. That's what's behind us when we do this same thing, the mercies of God. 
So now what is Paul uh, telling these believers to do? Paul wants them to present their whole bodies, their whole selves, to God as a living sacrifice. The word bodies here is a figure of speech where the part stands for the whole. And I think it's used for a reason here. Why does he use the word bodies as a figure of speech here? Well, he's talking about sacrifices. And it's meant to draw our attention back to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, of the Mosaic Covenant. And I just want to re remind you of that a little bit. For various reasons, at various times, Israelites would bring in different animals, and they'd come to the temple or the tabernacle earlier in the history of Israel, and they would bring these animals. And the first thing, uh, one of the first things that the priests would do is they would kill the animal. They, they'd kill the animal. Certain body parts would be removed. Uh, certain body parts would be placed on the altar, which is sort of like our modern grill. You know, they... They put the heat up and they burn the animal. And depending on the sacrifice, sometimes the sacrifice part of it was eaten. Uh, sometimes none of it was eaten. It was all burned up. It just depends on, on the sacrifice. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the body of the dead animal was placed on the altar. That's why Paul uses the word bodies here. He's emphasizing the fact that that part of us is what ends up on the altar, is the body. And I, I forget exactly where I heard this. I think I mentioned it before at a previous Compass sermon. I think it was Andrew Womack said this. The problem with being an, a living sacrifice is that living sacrifices tend to try to crawl off the altar. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why you killed the animal in the first place is so it doesn't start moving around when the heat gets turned up, right? And so... Uh, we think about uh, as persecution comes, as you begin to envy the life of unbelievers around you, as you get tempted with this or with that, uh, you get tempted to crawl off the altar. You get tempted to crawl off the altar. And so here what we find is uh, this is what surrender to the purposes of God looks like. It looks like staying on the altar and presenting our whole lives to God, even when the circumstances of life are difficult. And, and I want to be careful here because I don't want to portray putting ourselves on the altar as drudgery. Uh, even in the worst circumstances, it's not drudgery. And hopefully, you know, we won't uh, encounter incredible opposition in our lifetimes. None of us will be uh, actually physically martyred for our faith or anything like that. Uh, but we, we have to acknowledge that we face less persecution and danger for our faith than met, much of the rest of the world does. Um, and even, even what they face, even the things that they face, uh, they still see joy and fulfillment and blessings and wonder, even in the midst of this remarkable persecution. Um, it's, it reminds me, actually, of a story I came across recently. It was a, a pastor named Wayne Cordero. He's the pastor of uh, New Hope Christian Fellowship in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, a couple years ago, he went to China to train some house church leaders. Uh, he met with 22 people. And those 22 people who were meeting in secret because of the Chinese government uh, represented house church networks that covered 20 million people in that country. 22 people in authority over 20 million people, all in house church, underground house church networks. They can't, be, they can't meet publicly because of the government. Well, he didn't have 22 Bibles, so he passed out the Bibles that he could, and he noticed that one of the older ladies uh, handed her Bible off to the uh, girl next to her. And he said, okay, we're going to start in Second Peter. They go to Second Peter. And he noticed that as he was reading, she was reciting it word for word without having a Bible in front of her. So at the break, uh, he asked her how she knew the passage so well. And she said, oh, I memorized much of the Bible in prison. <laughs> And it was illegal for her to have a Bible in prison. So what people would do is they would smuggle in small bits of scripture uh, in different packages and things like that. And they would, the people, the Christians who were in prison at that time would, would quickly read and memorize as much as they could before those little scraps would get confiscated. And in that, she was able to memorize the whole book of Second Peter along with a lot of the rest of the New Testament. She said to him, they can't steal what's in your heart. Now, at the, at the end of three days, they were uh, together in a hotel room for three days. He was working with them, helping to train them for three days. The people asked Pastor Cordero to pray that China would be more like the U.S. because they wanted to meet more openly. They didn't want to have to deal with this fear of persecution. This is what uh, Wayne Cordero said to them. He said, you guys rode a train for 13 hours to get here. 
In my country, if you've got to drive more than an hour, people don't come. You sat on a wooden floor for three days. In my country, if people have to sit more than 40 minutes, they leave. You sat not only here for three days on a hard wooden floor, but you did it without air conditioning. In my country, if it's not padded pews and air conditioning, people don't often come back. In my country, we have an average of two Bibles per family. We don't read any of them. You hardly have any Bibles and you memorize them from pieces of paper. He said, I will not pray that you become like us. I pray that we become like you. So we, I just want to point out, we have brothers and sisters around the world that face extreme persecution. And in the midst of that, they have joy and peace and love and strength that does not come from them. That all comes from God. And the reason they have that is because their lives have been transformed because their whole lives are on the altar. That's why they're transformed. Their whole lives are about spiritual worship, as it says here in Romans 12.1. I heard a sermon recently that our brother Dave sent to me about worship. Uh, the pastor of uh, Times Square Church in New York uh, was talking about worship, and he said uh, that many of the fundamentals for worship are laid out in one of the earliest occurrences of the word worship in the Bible, which happens to be in Genesis chapter 22. And for those of you that don't have like the entire Bible memorized, uh, <laughs> Genesis 22 is the instant of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, one of the greatest acts of worship that's uh, given to us in the Bible is Abraham deciding that he was going to entrust Isaac on the altar. The thing that was most prized to him, the thing that God gave him, was put on the altar. This pastor said something interesting about worship. He said that the modern Christian movement has made worship about singing and music because singing and music doesn't ask anything more of us. We come in, we sing the songs together, we get our happy feeling, yay God, and we go out in the world and nothing changes. And while music is part of worship, that is not what worship is. And here in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it tells us to present our bodies on the altar. That's what worship is. Now, music can be part of that. Singing can be part of that. The manifestations or gifts of the Spirit, that's part of it too. But, but the, whole, the wholeness of what worship is, is putting our lives on the altar. And so we have to ask ourselves the question as we go into the new year, if we want to experience change, positive change, if we want to have our lives transformed, we have to ask our question, this question. Are our whole lives on the altar? Do we have a leg dangling off? Do we have an arm that's just, or a hand that's just like draped slightly off the side? Do we have something that we're holding back from that we feel like we need in our lives that what God would do with it is not necessarily take it away. He wouldn't necessarily burn it up. He might. I'm not going to tell you he won't. He might burn it up. But if he does burn it up, it's going to be because it's an act of transformation and it's because it's what we need. So where's our faith? Where's our trust? Is it in what we think is right or is it in God? Who knows whether it's right or not? So our whole lives should be presented to God as living sacrifices and by default, what it says here at the end here is that by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, that is what's defined as spiritual worship. So when I say our whole bodies, our whole lives should be living sacrifices, that we should put our whole lives on the altar, then our whole lives, we could say it another way, our whole lives could, should be viewed as worship. Not just here on Sunday morning, not just when Paul and Dave and Adam, when his thumb gets better, uh, are, are playing music for us. Uh, that's not the only time for worship. The only time for worship is not when we pray or when we have uh, gifts time, either you know, here or elsewhere, wherever the case might be. Our whole lives are viewed as worship. So I have some examples for us here. When you parent your kids in a way that leads them to follow Jesus, that's worship. When you forgive your enemy and pray for them, that is worship. When you stop to encourage a stranger and share God's love and hope with them, that is worship. When you obey in a moment of temptation, that is worship. So again, worship is not just praising God through song, though that's definitely a biblical aspect of worship. You can trace it through the Bible. It's biblical. 
Worship is not just about dancing or lifting your hands. Those, those, those things are biblical too. And we can trace those through the Bible as well. Worship's not just about the gifts or manifestations of the Spirit. Although those things are part of worship, and they're incredibly important for both our individual lives and for the lives of our church as a community. We have to begin to see worship bigger. Our whole lives should be lives of worship, giving praise, living to praise the God who gives us the very breath that we take. David once prayed, But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to thus offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Now, he was talking about what we would call financial giving, but it applies to our whole lives as well. And as I was researching this, this is what Doug Moo said in his commentary on this verse in Romans. He said, Regular meetings together of Christians for praise and mutual edification are appropriate and indeed commanded in Scripture. Look how scholarly that sounds. Uh, And what happens at those meetings is certainly worship. But such special times of corporate worship are only one aspect of the continual worship that each of us is to offer the Lord in the sacrifice of our bodies day by day. So there you have it. That's what worship is. It's everything. Worship is everything we do in service to the Lord. With that in mind, I want to take us to verse 2 here. Reread it here. In light of what we just read about presenting our bodies, about spiritual worship, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In verse 2, the word world here would be better translated as age. So do not be conformed to this age, and the implication is we're talking about the evil age that we live in. Um, As we developed in our series in Ephesians, the current age that we live in right now has systems in place that defy God, and we call those things the powers, the powers. So these systems, it's part of, it's a subset of what we've called the powers. So in other words, instead of conforming to what the powers want us to do, instead of doing what the systems of this world and what the devil and the influences of, of the demonic want us to do, what we, what we want to do is what God wants us to do. But there's a surprising part to this verse, and I mentioned it briefly in our Ephesians series, but if you blinked, you might have missed it. And that is that the verb translated be transformed here is not in the active voice, but it's in the passive voice. And I'm going to give you one more nerdy fact here before I explain all this. The phrase renewal of your mind is not a verb phrase, but it is a noun phrase. Now, it's a lot of nerdiness there in about three sentences, but (laughs) here's the bottom line. What this means is that we do not do this action that it's talking about here, but rather we receive the results of God's action here in this verse. And I know some of you will be thinking, yes, but we're supposed to bring every thought captivity to Christ. Yes, and in that verse, that is active. That's great. There are verses that encourage us to control our thinking and control our minds. I get that. There are verses like that where those are in the active voice and it is our responsibility. I'm not saying that we're not culpable or responsible at all. What I'm saying here is is that in this verse, in this passage, in this context, it's not active, it's passive. And what that means is our responsibility is to put our lives, our whole bodies, our whole selves on that altar. And when we put ourselves on the altar, we don't get burned up. We get transformed. We get transformed. And God transforms us by giving something that he calls the renewed mind. He gives us the renewed mind. Like our happy place we go to sometimes, right? That little beach somewhere where you're like, oh, I, don't, I can't hear my kids screaming if I'm just in my happy place here. Right? <laughs> That's sort of like what God gives us. It's more deep and profound than that, though. <laughs> Robert Mounts in his commentary on this verse said this. He says, although God brings about the transformation, we must voluntarily place ourselves at his disposal so it can happen. He will not transform us against our will. And then he says something about the present tense I thought was cool here. He said, the present tense suggests that the process is to continue throughout life. Transformation is not instantaneous. We have to keep putting ourselves on the altar. And as we keep putting ourselves on the altar and keep putting more of ourselves on the altar and throwing that shoulder that keeps wanting to roll off the altar back on, God continues to give us more. He continues to give us more transformation. So again, in the context here, our job is to keep putting ourselves on the altar. We keep presenting our lives, our bodies as living sacrifices. We keep resisting conformity to the world, this present evil age. 
uh, we keep uh, doing those things. Those, we keep resisting those ideas, those plans, those activities. As we do that, that's our responsibility. What God does is he works to transform our thinking, our speech, and our living. We have our responsibility, and God has his responsibility. So I've been reflecting, as you can tell, on the New Year, the subject of change. It reminded me of a, an old adage that's attributed to John Maxwell, although when you have something like this, it's like hard to think that John Maxwell came up with this. But what he said is he said, change is inevitable, growth is optional. Change is inevitable, growth is optional. So when we think about growth, you can grow the wrong direction. Uh, physically, I've been growing the wrong direction for like the last 10 years. So, um, you know, unlike Michael Jordan, I didn't get six, another growth spurt in life. I was 5'9 at age 14, and I've been 5'9 ever since. Uh, I had hopes of, dream, you know, dreams of being in the NBA when I was a little kid, too, watching tapes of Michael Jordan. But I never got that last growth spurt. So I've only gotten this kind of change, this kind of growth. So, but ch if change is inevitable, if our lives are going to change no matter what, but growth is optional then what we need to do as we enter the new year is to bring renewed intentionality and focus in our walk with God. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do this morning. Because we aren't just looking for change. Change is going to happen whether we want it to happen or not. We're looking for positive change that manifests as growth, as deliverance, as new horizons with God and within our community. I want to close by considering the story that we had from the beginning about Michael Jordan now, let's imagine a scenario where Michael makes a different choice sophomore year of high school. Maybe he decides not to play basketball that year. Uh, if he can't play varsity, he's not going to play at all. Now, he doesn't know it yet, but he's going to get this growth spurt this next year no matter what. He's going to grow physically. That's, gonna, that's just his genetics. He's just going gonna to grow. Now, we can imagine a world in which two things happen. First of all, he lost one year of conditioning. He lost one year of skill and practice and that would have cost him a lot. I also think that the, the mental frame that he would have been in would have been different. That because he didn't persevere that year, because he didn't keep working at it, that he would never have gotten the mental toughness that he was known so much for later in his life. Um, I would say that it's possible he would have still played in the NBA, but it's incredibly doubtful he would have ever been the greatest player of all time. In fact, you, we may not even know his name. He might have been a you know, couple year player in the NBA, might have washed out pretty quickly. Because the point is he had to practice, he had to work, he had to be intentional, physically yes, but also mentally, to be his best. And if you pay a lot of attention to it, I, I paid a lot of attention to Michael Jordan, really enjoyed watching him growing up, uh, you know that he exemplified this his entire career. He was one of the hardest workers, he was one of the strongest people mentally, he was going to outwork you, he was going to outhustle you, he was going to be mentally stronger than you. And that, that transformation started his sophomore year when he decided, I'm going to keep playing basketball. But that process took years. If you take him junior year and try to put him in the NBA, he's not going to score 35 points a game. He's not going to score any points. <laughs> it takes time. That transformation takes time. And I, this morning I want to relate that to our spiritual lives. You know, we will have moments. Sometimes it's years of discouragement of disappointment, of pain. It doesn't matter that we're not persecuted as much as the people in China are. We do face real disappointment. We do face real discouragement. We do face real pain. And it doesn't do us any good to compare ourselves with others. We each fight our own battles. So my encouragement is to keep going, to keep crawling back onto the altar, to keep fighting for your faith, to keep fighting for your family and your community of faith, our lives aren't always easy or fun, but we know that God is with us through it all. And as we resist the impulses, the messages, uh, the plans, the purposes of this evil age, we know that God transforms us. He shows us how to live in a way that reflects his nature of love, grace, and mercy. And as we close this morning, I want to underline the importance of spiritual community in all of this. None of us, we don't live in isolation. We live in a community of faith. We live in a community of a group of people who care about each other genuinely and love each other. There are things in my life that I've dealt with that I can share with you, ways that I've failed, ways that I've succeeded, and both of those things can help you. And um, ways in which God has changed my heart and my mind uh, and trans has transformed me that you might find helpful. And similarly, you might have gone through things where 
you failed or you succeeded, and then God transformed things and moved things around for you and helped you develop and change into a person that can help me with something that I'm dealing with. Um, we've all been shaped and molded by God in ways that are helpful to each other, and that's why we find ourselves in community right now. So please don't isolate yourself. We are a church to help each other. We are connected to help each other. And of course, we know that God can work within us each individually through the power of the Spirit that he's given to us, but he can also work in surprising ways. Uh, I'm reminded here at this moment about Balaam and a donkey that God worked through <laughs> <laughs> to save his life. God can work in surprising ways. Uh, how much easier is it for him to work in a brother or a sister than a donkey? <laughs> <laughs> so as we, as we enter into the new year, as Amanda said, we're going to be getting into the story of the Exodus. And I'm very excited for this. We just planned it through with all the teachers of the series uh, this earlier this past week and um, I'm very excited for for how this will be a time of uh, transformation I hope for all of us individually and transformation collectively as a community uh, as we walk through this period of transformation called the Exodus uh, that really becomes the picture of uh, the template for God's renewal uh, throughout the rest of the Bible and so my encouragement is, as you are intentional about putting yourselves back on the altar, that you also are intentional about rereading the, uh, at least the first couple chapters of the book of Exodus uh, in the next week, and because um, we're going to be going fast. Uh, and uh, so you'll want to have some of those details fresh in your mind. I think it'll be helpful for you. So with that, we'll pray. Father, we're thankful that you are um, a God that we can trust, that you are a God that we can have faith in. You are God that we can entrust our whole beings to. And Father, we don't do it perfectly. We don't put our whole bodies on the altar every day or in every moment. The only one who did that was your son, Jesus. And um, man, we're thankful for that example. We're thankful for what he accomplished for us. Help us, God. Help us to, um, to become more and more transformed. Help us to put more and more of our trust in you. Help us to put more and more of our lives, our bodies on the altar. Help us to worship you in ways that we uh, don't understand or comprehend yet. Help us to see ways that we can uh, dig deeper into you and your presence this year. Father, help this year be a year of positive growth, of positive change. Um, help us to become more and more conformed to the image of your son as we look unto his glorious image. And it's in his name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information on how we are striving to follow Jesus together here in Louisville, Kentucky, check out our website, compasslu.org, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and view additional resources.